These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos.htm or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you. Well, now we're going to start discussing radical reactions. And a little bit of the bad news here is that the material that we learned about earlier for alkenes actually won't help us much here. And the reason is all the previous reactions we've learned about have not been radical reactions. Uh, so radical reactions are kind of a different category that follow different principles. In fact, maybe I should have started with that. All the reactions we've done so far we used electron pushing arrows that look like this. Now, this shows you the movement of something. What does it show you the movement of? It shows you the movement of electrons. We should have been more specific previously and said, this shows us the movement of electron pairs. Mm -hmm. This shows us how electron pairs are going to move. And the single-headed arrows. The That's right. Now we're going to be talking about radical reactions. Do you know well, what is a radical? It's a single electron with no home. That's right. Now, maybe we shouldn't say no home. It has a home, but it has no, it has no companion. Uh, it's a got a lonely home. home. A yeah, lonely it's home. a lonely home. That's right. So it's an unpaired electron. As we were just saying, this, this shows us the movement of electron pairs. Normally, electrons like to be in pairs. A radical is an unpaired electron. A radical is an unpaired electron. A radical is an unpaired electron. Well, when we're moving a single electron around, as it looks like you were remembering, we use a single-headed arrow. So this is the type of arrow we use for radical mechanisms, single-headed, and this is the type of arrow we use for non-radical mechanisms. I don't know if there's a snazzy name for a non-radical mechanism, but it's just the opposite of radical mechanisms. I guess the logic here is well, this, these are also called fish hooks. So this has a fish hook. I guess the logic is if you put two fish hooks on, each fish hook maybe represents one of the electrons. So here's one electron and there's another electron. But there's only one electron, you only have half as many fish hooks. So that's the reasoning here. The electron is still going from here to here. Yeah, so we'll have to talk a little bit about how to deal with these single headed arrows because they're actually quite a bit different than the double headed arrows. Now, the, the great majority of the reactions you're going to deal with this in this course are non-radical mechanisms. Um, you're going to deal with a lot more non-radical than radical mechanisms. However, this particular chapter happens to focus on radicals, so we have to uh, settle down and deal with that. But you should keep in mind that what we're going to talk about today doesn't apply to most reactions, which are non-radical mechanisms. And it's heat or light that usually Initiates. causes the reaction to go. That's right. Okay. Well, what we'll see is you need some type of radical initiator. And the common types of radical initiators we'll start with are heat or light. That's correct. Is that just because salt, different solvents don't make it go? Well, obviously we'll need a solvent as well. Okay. But generally the solvent is not what determines whether it's going to be a radical mechanism or not. When we go through the mechanism, we'll see why we need an initiator. But we're not quite ready for that yet. Let's see, what do we need here? Well, we have to talk a little bit about how to use these single-headed arrows. Let's see here. What can you do with a single-headed arrow? Um, well, we need to show two things. We have to show how we can make a bond with single-headed arrows. Well, the way you make a bond is like this. Notice this is a totally different type of pattern than with the double-headed arrows. Mm -hmm. When we had double-headed arrows, we never had the head with the head of one arrow pointing to the head of another arrow. You just don't do that. But with single-headed arrows, the convention is that you do show the two arrows pointing towards each other. Since we don't do that with double-headed arrows, students have a hard time remembering that we do it with single-headed arrows. This is how we make a bond. This is only how you make a bond in radical mechanisms. It's not how we make a bond for the double-headed arrows, but this is what we're dealing with right now. I think it's kind of intuitive that this shows that we're using these two unpaired electrons to make a bond. What happened to this electron? Well, it went over here. And what happened to this electron? It went over here. We know that a bond really represents two electrons, even though we don't usually draw the two electrons in the bond. 
So this is a fairly intuitive notation. That's really all you can do with an unpaired electron. All you can do with an unpaired electron is make a bond with it. And the other type of error that we need to know about is when you're moving electrons out of a bond. So what does it mean when the head of the arrow is on an atom? Well, now we're taking the two electrons out of the bond and making them into radical unpaired electrons. We're taking the two electrons out of the bond and moving them like this. Even though it's not technically necessary, it might be clearer to actually draw the two electrons here at the tail, so you can see how they're moving around. Of course, remember, there's many other electrons around this bromine. There's three other pairs. But we're not going to draw those pairs because they're not interesting. We're only going to draw this radical. OK, so basically, I just wanted to review. There's two places you can put the head of a uh, radical arrow. You can have two heads pointing towards each other, and that means you're forming a bond. Or the head can be on an atom, which means you're forming an unpaired electron. If the head is pointing to an atom, you're forming a radical unpaired electron. And if the two heads are pointing towards each other, you're doing a bond formation. Those are the two types of formation with radical arrows. This one in particular is a lot different than with double-headed arrows. Now, another really big difference from the double-headed arrows is the charges don't change in radical mechanisms. I was really trying to emphasize last time how important it is to focus on the charges, but we're going to have to put that aside because the charges don't change here. I think you can kind of see that even here. Um, here, this bromine owns one electron. Now, here, the bromine is sharing two electrons, which means it really kind of just owns one of them, in a sense. So the, the, the charge on the bromine hasn't changed. There's no difference between owning an electron and sharing two electrons. Uh, and here, the bromine was sharing two electrons and ended up owning one of them. Well, both of those give it the same charge, the same formal charge. Yeah, I should say that it, at least if you're using formal charges, the charges are not going to change. The charges are not going to change. And we're always going to start with an uncharged species. So in radical mechanisms, there are no charges. In radical mechanisms, there are no charges. No charges in radical mechanisms. Now, in a way, that seems bad because the charges really helped us. Remember, the charges told us who the reactive atom was going to be. We focused on the charge as the reactive atom. Why is the charge giving you the reactive atom? Because the charge makes the atom unhappy. Well, we have to figure out who's unhappy then in a radical mechanism. Well, if somebody has an unpaired electron, does that make it happy or unhappy? Unhappy. Unhappy. So now, instead of looking for the charges, we look for the unpaired electron. And we know that that's going to be one of the atoms involved in the next step. Anybody who has an unpaired electron is going to want to try to get rid of that unpaired electron because, as we discussed at the beginning, electrons prefer to be paired. So the, the radicals, the unpaired electrons, play the role of the charges here in telling us who to focus on. I guess those are the basic ideas. And now we can see how this mechanism would work. Oh, of course, remember, this is the head. And this is the tail. The electron is coming from here and going to here. So let's say we take this compound here. One thing that's important to notice here is that this has no functional groups. Mm -hmm. What do we call a hydrocarbon that's got no functional groups? It's just an alkane. It's just a normal alkane. So we just have a normal alkane here. And we have a diatomic halogen. And we have our radical initiator. And we're going to go through the steps. I don't know if you happen to know the steps, or should we just go through them together? Do you know what the first step might be here? Let's go through it together. OK. Well, it turns out that we're going to start by focusing on this chlorine. Here's the first step. That's something I don't think you could really just figure out out of your head. We, we just have to have it memorized. But now that I've shown you the arrows, you should be able to show what the intermediates are from this step. So now let's try to draw the intermediates from that step. Great. The arrows tell us what the intermediates look like. We get two chlorine radicals. Good. We could clarify that by actually drawing in this pair of electrons so we can see how they're moving, although people don't usually do that. No charges change. Uh, remember, there's actually three other lone pairs in each of these chlorines, but we don't care about those. We're only going because they're not unhappy. We're only going to show the unhappy radicals. But this we definitely have to show, the unpaired electron. Good. 
Now, this is what's called the initiation step. And that should make sense because it was our initial step. And the initial step that initiates the reaction is the initiation step. Uh, one thing you're likely to be tested on, I, I th think I saw some examples there, is he might give you like a multiple choice problem and say, which of the following steps represents initiation? Say, mm -hmm. well, how can you tell this was initiation? Um, it should be pretty clear because we started with no radicals. So we can't be in the middle of the radical mechanism because then we'd already have a radical. So if we're starting with no radicals, that's a clue that that's initiation. Later in the course, you might see some initiation steps that actually start with a radical, but I don't know if you're going to get into any of that this term. So if you're not starting with any radicals, that's an initiation step. 